do. Um, but it's very um, inspiring to be working so closely with all of you, especially all the Osseo warriors and their families. I'm so touched by uh, your love and your dedication. So thank you for welcoming me into this amazing community. It's been a pleasure to be working with MIB over several years now. And in addition to being very meaningful, this conference is also so much fun that I was even able to convince one of my own kids, my lovely daughter Beatrix is here, to attend this meeting with me. <laughs> um, and it's a pleasure to introduce our amazing panel of speakers today. So first up, we're gonna hear from uh, Dr. Jessica Davis. Dr. Davis is an associate professor and the director of surgical pathology at Oregon Health and Science University. And she's actively engaged in clinical and translational research on bone and soft tissue tumors. So nationally and internationally, she serves on the Children's Oncology Group um, as a central pathology reviewer and on the bone um, steering committee. <coughs> Dr. Davis is vice president for a nonprofit organization focused on collaborative research on pediatric sarcomas, the Sprites Group. Next up after Dr. Davis, we'll hear from Dr. Brian Crompton, um, who I'm a, a honored to be able to work on several projects with him in Boston. So Dr. Crompton is a pediatric oncologist and a physician scientist at Dana-Farber Boston Children's Cancer Center and Blood Disorder Center. His research focuses on utilizing genomic and proteomic technologies to identify and validate new therapeutic targets for pediatric solid tumors and to develop non-invasive biomarkers of treatment response and resistance to these diseases. His laboratory has developed new approaches to estimating circulating tumor DNA or ctDNA levels from liquid biopsy samples from patients with pediatric solid tumors, and he's a world leader in this field. Next up is Dr. Maz Hayashi, who's a physician scientist at the University of Colorado and Children's Hospital of Colorado. He's leading a translationally focused laboratory research program in childhood sarcomas. His laboratory has been focused on the identification of novel anti-metastasis targets for sarcomas through the detection and interrogation of circulating tumor cells, as well as high throughput sequencing screening methods. His laboratory aims to change the current treatment paradigm by detecting metastases early and treating metastases differently to improve the cure rates of sarcomas. And last up, we'll hear from Dr. Flesner, who is an associate professor of clinical oncology and the director of oncology clinical trials at the University of Pennsylvania School of Veterinary Medicine. The current focus of his research is based on translational models of naturally occurring cancer in companion animals, focusing on chemotoxicity and chemotherapy mechanisms of action and improving chemotherapy efficacy with novel combination protocols or investigational drugs. So first up, let's welcome Dr. Davis, who will be talking to us about optimizing your pathology experience with bone sarcomas. Good morning. I, as Alana mentioned, we are both pathologists, and it's really my pleasure and honor to be here to interact with all of you, the oncologists, and most importantly, the osteo warriors and families. And today I'm going to talk about um, not all the omics and data series that you've been seeing over the last hours and what you'll see after my talk, but really about pathology and what happens to the samples that come through the pathology labs. So in overview, I'm just going to talk kind of broadly about what happens behind the scenes in the pathology lab and some of the challenges that are faced with bone specimens, such as in osteosarcoma. And then some recent successes um, that we've had in, in uh, conjunction with the COG and some of the work I've been doing with the COG and with the College of American Pathology, where I serve as the liaison to create CAP tumor synoptics. So really, just a broad overview. For some of you, this may be information that you know, and for some of you, you may be new to this. But what happens to the tissue that comes through the pathology lab? So there's several steps that have to happen in order for a diagnosis to be rendered, for tissue to be collection for, collected for research purposes, um, and for a final pathology report to be issued. And the first step of that is for accessioning to occur. So what is accessioning? So the tissue or the specimen is given a unique case number or identification identifier for that case. So for example, for 2022, a case number may be rendered such as SP22-1983. So some cases, as you guys may be aware, may have a frozen section performed. So what is a frozen section? So a frozen section is a rapid way for 
um, usually intraoperatively for the surgeon and the pathologist to communicate and to make a rapid assessment. So if a frozen section is performed, this would be performed on fresh tissue. So we often talk about fresh tissue in comparison to formal and fixed tissue. And so this is fresh tissue. So a small piece of tissue is placed in this polysaccharide matrix called OCT, as uh, seen there. And this tissue is then free frozen in a piece of equipment, as seen in this picture, which is called a cryostat. And this machine um, can freeze the tissue, and then there's a blade in there where we can cut the tissue, and we can rapidly read this under the microscope. And there's pros and cons of doing this. So a pro of this is it's rapid. So usually we can turn around a frozen section in about 20 minutes, and this can help with margins. It can help triage tissue to tell us if viability is the tissue viable or not. There's some cons um, that I won't go into too detail detailed, but there's frozen section artifact, and there's difficulty, particularly in osteosarcoma, that you can't really cut bone very well. So the next step in this process, um, if there's a frozen section performed, or even if there isn't, is to do a gross evaluation of the tissue. Um, and this is a detailed description of what the tissue is received um, and describe it in many ways. So the tumor size, the shape, the characteristics, the relationship to margins, and other normal structures. And this is really vital for proper staging and margin assessment for any of the tissues we receive. This is also the point in time where either a pathologist in some institutions, but pretty rarely, or a resident or a pathologist assistant um, would section the tumor uh, and put it into these cassettes as demonstrated as the blue containers in that, in that photograph. And we would then create a cassette index so that the pathologist who then looks at the slides knows what they're looking at under the microscope. This would also be the point in the process where the tissue is fresh that we would allocate tissue for perhaps research specimens. So in COG protocols or other tissue allocation, we would um, select tissue to be sent for various clinical trials. Um, so at this point, I'm showing you both a biopsy sample and then also a resection specimen where we'd have bigger pieces of tissue. I do need to warn you on my next slide there, if you're squeamish, please look away because I'm going to show you a gr gross photograph of an osteosarcoma. So if you don't want to look, please close your eyes. So gross valuation is different if you have a biopsy or a resection specimen. For biopsies, this likely is completed in one day. The exception is if the bone biopsy is very heavily calcified, and that might need to take a few hours or even overnight to decalcify, and we'll talk about de decalcification a little bit more. For large resection specimens, this is a multiple day process. So, so for the oncologists in the room where you're calling your pathologist and like, why aren't my results back? This is why. So we're going to walk through this process and same with patients and families of like, why isn't the pathologist done? Well, we're working on it, I promise. So day one, we have to prep the specimen. Well, what does prepping the specimen mean? Well, you want your margins assessed, right? You want to know, is the tumor out or not? So we ink it. We use a special ink that we can see both, obviously, grossly, but also under the microscope. So we ink the specimen. We sample any tissue that's needed for fresh um, studies, so flow cytometry, not necessary for osteosarcoma, but if there's any concern for a small round blue cell tumor, for research needs, et cetera. And then we actually need to cut the bone. So that is cut fresh on um, specialized saws. They're basically like a bandsaw that you would have in your wood shop. And then a slab of the tissue is submitted for decalcification. And then there's various decal um, procedures that can be used. And I'll talk about that in a second. Um, before the tissue can be decalcified, it actually needs to be put into formalin for fixation. So before decalcification, it needs to be fixed. And so then it will usually be fixed overnight. And then on day two, it will be put into decalcification. You can also do sampling of soft tissue on day two. And you've noticed there I'll put day pound sign. Well, the decalcification process can take a number of days um, yet to be determined. And that's based on the size of the tissue, how ossified it is, what decalcification solution you're using, among other things. So this can take hours to days. And then the, the photo that I'm showing you there is indeed an osteosarcoma resection specimen. And what is standard of care is then to create a map of the largest um, dimension of the tumor, and the entire thing is submitted for histologic evaluation. And from that, we score the present treatment response in a neoadjuvantly treated resection. So then what happens? 
Well, after all of those cassettes are, are created, the tissue is then placed in a tissue processor, and this typically processes overnight. There are some rapid processors, but that's usually for biopsies. And this is um, where it goes under cycles of chemicals to help with tissue fixation. The next day, so we're still going through the lab. This is why it takes a while. We're not trying to hold up your results, I promise. The tissue then gets embedded, um, so it goes from that cassette into paraffin, and that's done by specialized techs called histology technicians. They embed the tissue into paraffin wax. It then goes through microtomy, where they actually cut that wax and create that slide that you're seeing in the middle, and then the tissue gets stained to the final result of an H&E section. The pathologist, so Alana or myself, will look under the microscope to make a diagnosis as if, it, if it's a diagnostic biopsy, or look at a resection specimen to score, say, treatment effect, resections, uh, margins, et cetera. So when we get a specimen, I think it's really important to think about, well, what is the goal of each sample? So a biopsy is largely for diagnostic purposes. So we're looking at the H&E. We may perform immunohistochemical stains, which can take other, uh, another day. Usually we, in our lab, at least if we order them in the morning, we can get them out later that afternoon, but it may be the next day. Um, from that FFPE, which stands for formalin fixed paraffin embedded tissue, you can usually perform molecular um, tests, including FISH, which just stands for fluorescence in situ hybridization, PCR, and next generation sequencing. Resections typically are for therapeutic purposes, and yes, there's a typo there. Um, and what does a pathologist need to do from that specimen? When we need to confirm the diagnosis, we usually also want to grade the diagnosis. So most osteosarcomas are high grade, but there are some subtypes which are not, so paraosteal or periosteal. And then we also want to make sure we stage the tumor, assess margins, and assess treatment effect. And from many of these things, there's remaining tissue that can be used for research protocols. So what are some of the challenges we face with all specimens and some unique aspects of bone specimens? Well, decalcification, so the good, bad, and the ugly. Well, bone is made of protein plus calcium hydroxyapatite. Hydroxyapatite crystals are really, really hard to cut, so they can't be cut without some sort of decalcification. It's just impossible to do. You can hurt yourself trying to do this with the scalpel blade. So there's a variety of different decalcifiers that can be used in the lab usually composed of a variety of different acids um, and or EDTA, um, which is a chelator. Most acids are really bad for further nucleic acid extractions, which many of you guys are interested in, whether to do sequencing for um, clinical purposes, to find targets, or for research purposes. What I use in my lab is Formacal 2000 which is predominantly EDTA and formic acid for biopsies. And the reason why I do it that way is because it's really slow. So EDTA is slow, acids are fast. And for larger resection specimens, we use hydrochloric acid-based um, substances. And I'm happy to talk more about decalcification in the question and answer session. So needle core biopsies, so this has become um, a mainstay of many institutions for diagnostic biopsies because they're much uh, easier for many patients to undergo versus an open biopsy. But you can see here, tissue adequacy depends on the viability, the cellularity, the tumor content, and volume. Here are some representative images of needle core biopsies. So for example, the bottom image from the radiology report, this was five 18-gauge needle biopsies that were obtained from the patient, and then what actually showed up on my slide. Um, so usually, four to six needle core biopsies are adequate for diagnosis, but that's just for diagnosis, and there may not be ample tissue for further studies. And if you think about an 18-gauge needle versus a 20-gauge needle, the 18-gauge needle will have five times um, the nucleic acid yield, and that's from some references I have at the end of my talk. And volumetrically, um, just thinking about you know, clinical trial needs where we often are asked for a gram of tissue. To get a gram of tissue from an 18-gauge needle, you would need 77 cores. Nobody's gonna do that to a patient. So what have been some recent successes? I'll go through this pretty quickly. Um, we have really had some successes, and that's really with communication with pathologists and asking us ahead of time to get involved in clinical trials and letting us know when patient samples are coming through the lab so we can get involved early on. 
This is um, one of the recent studies that is open through the COG um, in metastatic osteosarcoma, uh, AOS um, T2031 with metastatic disease in the lung. And I can't go through all of this, it's tiny, tiny font, but this is a diagram that's really um, with uh, Ryan Roberts and um, that really showed pathologists of a guideline of how to triage the samples as they come through the lab and the prioritization of tissue collection and really working with pathologists of showing them how to do that tissue collection and how to prioritize biology samples and helping them because this is added work to the pathologists. Also built into that study is a huge discussion of decal. So again, not meant to be read, but showing that we're working really hard in these clinical trial developments to emphasize how important decal in solutions that aren't harsh acid is to make sure that we're uh, collecting nucleic acids. Other work that I've been working on is working with the CAP and um, their protocols being templated um, and making sure that there's ways to write in these protocols, um, other means to get uh, samples collected. So CAP requires that all diagnostic slides and blocks be kept for 10 years, but there's alternative ways other than blocks. So you can have uh, slides, so unstained slides, that can be collected for clinical trials. You can also create research blocks or other alternatives um, for tissue collection. And keeping in mind with all of this, this costs time or money to a pathology department. This is what I also alluded to is through the CAP, I've been working ongoing efforts to have templated reporting. And in conjunction with this, there's an organization called the AAPA, which is the American Association of Pathologist Assistants. And for the first time this year, they've put into their grossing templates information about decal status, including what type of decal solution is being used in the gross. So in summary, I hope you guys have a better understanding of how a pathology sample goes through the lab, some of the challenges, but also some of the recent successes. Thanks. Hi, everyone. Uh, Brian Crompton, uh, and I'm really excited to be here. This is my first Factor Conference, so um, I'm super pumped to be here. And uh, it's been great to meet everybody. And, and uh, I think that first panel uh, that opened up the session today uh, was just really inspiring. So I um, uh, hope, hope we can make some progress. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about liquid biopsies. Uh, this is an area of research in my laboratory. Uh, it's really the primary focus of my group. Um, the idea around liquid biopsies is that uh, fragments or, or um, uh, pieces of uh, tumor can sometimes circulate in the blood, um, and we can identify those, uh, those fragments uh, and use them for research purposes and for clinical decision making. Um, and what I'm going to mostly focus on the first part of my talk and for most of the talk is this uh, circulating tumor DNA, which is really fragments of DNA, not circulating in a cell, but really just fragments of DNA circulating free in the blood. Um, and they can be um, uh, there for about an hour, but they're sort of continuously shed. Um, and, and what we can do to identify those uh, fragments uh, and how we can use them to make some uh, clinical inferences and discoveries. Um, so if circulating tumor DNA is uh, circulating in the blood, what can we use them for? So this is um, meant to be uh, like a, an outline of a patient's course through diagnosis, treatment, uh, relapse uh, and, and potentially subsequent uh, multiple relapses um, and where we might be able to use liquid biopsy to make uh, to make things different um, and so right from the point where a patient's undergoing a new workup for a new tumor we might be able to f we can use cell-free DNA or circulating tumor DNA to find some of the mutations that characterize a patient's tumor and this could be useful for identifying things that might be targetable that might infer uh, help uh, clinicians make uh, choices about treatment we also can quantify how much circulating tumor DNA is in a given blood sample. Uh, and, and what we found so far is that in a lot of cancers, uh, including osteosarcoma, the amount of circulating tumor DNA present right at the point of diagnosis uh, tells us a little something about how they might respond to uh, traditional standard upfront therapy. Um, we can also follow how circulating tumor DNA levels change over time in response to therapy. And this, uh, we believe, will give us a good idea of whether patients are responding appropriately to a therapy or whether we need to think very early on about changing therapies to something more intensive or perhaps even something more experimental uh, in the hopes that we can still capture this um, 
precious opportunity on the first round of, of treatment to make the cancer go away and never come back. Um, circulating tumor DNA also rises again at the point uh, when patients go on to develop a progression or a relapse. Um, and so this may be something we can use as a harbinger of a relapse where we might be able to catch it much earlier. And if, if that doesn't necessarily mean we can cure it after relapse, it may mean that we can significantly um, prolong the time um, uh, uh, to death after, after a relapse. And, uh, and then um, because we can use these, this circulating tumor DNA really as we would a biopsy, um, uh, we can do discovery sequencing on, on the, the circulating tumor DNA we detect in the blood. So it'll, it may be the first opportunity for us to really think about how tumors are changing over time to become, most tumors are, are responsive to therapy early on, how will they become resistant over time? And can we find mechanisms for resistance that may be actually um, something we could target as a new re relapse therapy or even to prevent the emergence of relapse in the first place. So that's how we're thinking about the use of circulating tumor DNA. Um, the way you try to um, uh, detect and profile circulating tumor DNA really depends on the question you wanna ask along that clinical path and a little bit um, dependent on the cancer type. Uh, and so one of the approaches my um, laboratory is uh, focused on is actually not taking one approach to profiling circulating tumor DNA, but really taking all of the approaches that are known out there for profiling circulated, circulating tumor DNA. So this may mean low passage whole genome sequencing, which allows us to find all the copy number changes that we know are very characteristic in osteosarcoma, um, DDPCR, which allows us to, f to follow a single point mutation over time, uh, but is very sensitive and detects very low levels of circulating tumor DNA. We can look at handful of gene locations uh, using a panel, um, or we can do big, 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 big data type of genome sequencing also on um, uh, cell-free DNA samples. We look can look for modifications of uh, uh, um, of DNA, including methylation of the uh, tumors, which may help us with subclassification um, in uh, cancers generally, but also in osteosarcoma. And then there's a whole host of really new, super cutting edge stuff that I don't have time to talk about today, but we are engaging in collaborators and have some of our own uh, ideas we're trying to push forward um, to, to really push, push us to the cutting edge of, of using liquid biopsy uh, to understand the biology of osteosarcoma and uh, inform clinical care. Um, I think uh, this sort of uh, harkens harkens back to uh, Dr. Marinoff's uh, talk earlier today where um, you saw the osteosarcoma uh, tumors have a lot of copy number changes and, alt and genomic level alterations. And we use that in specifically in osteosarcoma to, f to find circulating tumor DNA. So we use this low passage whole genome sequencing, um, which I'm happy to talk to, uh, to anybody offline about how that works, but it's relatively cost effective. Um, because we don't do a lot of sequencing, um, but it, and it helps us find these copy number changes that are so characteristic of osteosarcoma. When we find them, we know we have tumor DNA in the blood, and, and then we can also use it to, to estimate how much circulating tumor DNA in the blood. And um, in this copy number plot that's uh, on the left lower corner, um, you can see that, it, that there's a lot of red dots above the zero line and a lot of green dots below the zero line. And those are the copy number variants across chromosomes one through 23 that, um, that we expect to see in a patient whose tumor DNA um, has made it into the blood. And actually, if you look uh, above the eight there in the plot, you can see a really high peak of dots, and that's actually where MYC lives. So in theory, we can actually detect MYC amplifications in circulating tumor DNA if there's enough circulating tumor DNA in a sample. And then um, on the other side of the slide, um, on the right side, you can see that um, we, a few years ago, showed that when CT DNA levels are very high in a patient with newly diagnosed, localized only, so no evidence on imaging of any spread, uh, when they're circulating tumor DNA is higher, the likelihood that they'll eventually go on to have a relapse is much higher than patients who have low CT DNA. And this, this was in a retrospective cohort uh, collected from Children's Oncology Group, um, which needs to be really validated in our prospective study. So Dave Shulman at Dana-Farber has organized a multi-institutional um, prospective study, uh, actually focusing on both human sarcoma and osteosarcoma, where patients with localized only uh, osteosarcoma enroll and we get samples prior to the start of therapy and then multiple times during therapy and even during surveillance off therapy. Um, and part of the goal of that is to validate this initial finding from a couple years ago. 
um, which will, if, if validated prospectively, will mean we can start clinically implementing the utilization of, of liquid biopsies for upfront risk stratification. And I think that may help us think about even in patients who have, we expect have a really good outcome, maybe de-intensify in therapy, or for patients who have a higher uh, risk of, of uh, relapse after therapy, enrolling them on the high-risk uh, studies um, in the future, um, rather than relying only on the presence or absence of metastatic disease. Um, this study actually has uh, progressed really nicely, a little bit slowed down by COVID, but um, we're now, uh, we've now accrued all the patients we need to. We have to now collect serial samples uh, from some, some of the patients who enrolled toward the end of the study, and then we'll have to um, wait an extra year to see um, what the outcomes are. But uh, we're pretty excited about um, being able to really validate those initial findings. There's other opportunities to validate liquid biopsy um, in osteosarcoma. These are the two COG trials. One is for patients with metastatic osteosarcoma who will undergo surgery by either um, open thoracotomy or thoracoscopy. Um, and uh, serial samples will be collected on this study. Um, and those will get banked and be open to multiple investigators who are interested in this field. And then uh, coming down very soon will be an upfront uh, children's oncology group study for newly diagnosed localized and metastatic osteosarcoma patients. We'll probably enroll hundreds, probably over 500 patients over the course of a five-year period. And we're embedding a collection for bl of blood samples for liquid biopsy studies going forward. <clears throat> So that's the most mature liquid biopsy field, I think, for pediatrics, really for cancer generally. But there is also an opportunity to look um, at um, things that are not just DNA. So um, there are also, in, in some patients who have cancer, including osteosarcoma, so the presence of circulating tumor cells. Um, and those can tell you things that are not informed by DNA alone. So you can look at transcription or even protein or antigen levels. I'm going to just show you one way that uh, very quickly of how we're thinking about utilizing the presence of circulating tumor cells, intact cells in a blood sample. Um, we're looking at patients who are going, who have experienced relapse where the burden of disease is higher, where we think CTCs are more prominent and isolating those CTCs and profiling their antigen profile. Um, one, to tell uh, us exactly which cells in the blood are circulating tumor cells, and then to actually look to see whether the thing that's being targeted is changing over time. So the idea here is that if you have a circulating tumor cell or a cancer cell that's being targeted because with an antibody, for example, against a, a, a protein or a molecule on the surface of the cell that's really specific to the cancer, one obvious way the cancer can evade that therapy is to just stop expressing it. Um, and if it can get away with that, you've automatically got resistance. But we don't really know if that happens because when patients go on to um, uh, late phase trials, we rarely get a biopsy after um, patients come off uh, early phase studies. And so this is a way that during therapy, we can see whether some of the antigen profiles are changing over time. Um, and so we're, this is a project we've been working on. And we have um, uh, a cohort of patients uh, that are enrolled uh, who have osteosarcoma who have been enrolled in an NIH trial called PEPN1921, uh, where there's an uh, antibody drug conjugate that's targeting HER2 expression in, in patients who have HER2 expressing osteosarcoma. And one of the things we're going to look at is, does that HER2 expression change over time as a way for the cells to evade therapy? And I think this will inform now going forward, you know, both who should stay on a therapy like this, um, because maybe their HER2 stays expressing, or are there other things we should be doing when we're giving this, uh, this drug to try to um, boost up uh, HER2 expression? Or maybe HER2 levels will stay up, and th then we know there's a different mechanism of resistance. So this is just one way we're thinking about utilizing circulating tumor cells to inform clinical trials going forward. Um, there's a ton more to talk about in liquid biopsy. I, I expect Maz is going to go into a whole bunch of, new, of other things as well, um, but i um, happy to have uh, answer questions uh, later on. There's a lot of people to thank, uh, a lot of funders involved in, in these sort of large-scale trials um, and, and sample collections and experiments, um, uh, So, and, and uh, looking forward to taking questions in a little bit. I'm Moss Hayashi. I'm from the Children's Hospital Colorado, uh, University of Colorado, Denver. Um, it's such an honor to be here. Um, I was here a couple years ago, I think, when I was in Florida. And it's always such a great meeting where I feel like the energy from the patients, uh, families, patient advocates, and the researchers and doctors all come together. 
and it's such an honor to um, talk here. Today, I just wanted to go over a quick overview about uh, our multi-center trial that we're running right now at, through uh, National Pediatric Cancer Foundation. Uh, go over a little bit of data, of uh, prelim data that we had before we went in there. So as Brian talked about, um, liquid biopsies, um, I promise there's only one prelim like pilot introductory slide. <laughs> so liquid biopsies are, it, it's anything liquid that comes out. People have looked at urine, uh, but mostly we were looking at blood. And in, when tumors are growing in the body, then it starts secreting all sorts of things into the blood. And this is a probably an old concept that's been around for a while. Um, adult cancers, there's a lot of tumor micro markers that we measure. And so not just tumor markers, but we can find circulating tumor cells, which one could say that is the seeds of metastasis. And then there's DNA fragments, so circulating tumor DNA, cell-free DNA uh, that it comes out in the blood. Uh, mRNA fragments that have been tried and failed in multiple ways. Um, microRNA and then also exosomes, which are, can contain all sorts of genetic information in there. So uh, in our previous work, uh, when we were looking at circulating tumor cells, uh, sarcoma circulating tumor cells are very different from carcinoma circulating tumor cells. So carcinomas, as you think about it, is the majority of adult cancers, like breast cancer, colon cancer. And there's a significant difference in their biology that makes um, methods that have been used for those kind of cancers to be very difficult to translate into sarcomas. Uh, one way we've tried to bypass that is to use uh, size-based selection. So those of you who have looked at sarcoma cells maybe floating in CSF, uh, a lot of these cancer cells are giant and they can be captured using size-based filtration. So this is some work um, from our previous work. So there's a membrane that we use, and then we can actually detect um, circulating tumor cells or circulating tumor clusters that are shown here uh, in the blood uh, from patients uh, with osteosarcoma or other sarcomas. And then uh, these uh, counts, we've uh, started some correlation with uh, early phase trials. So this is a gem cytobine. Um, a Braxine trial that has been running through NPCF and the CTC burden, there's some correlation with treatment response, patients who have persistent uh, or disappearance and lower CTC seem to respond better. Um, also these CTCs, as I said, are the seeds of metastasis. So uh, for the past few years, we've been working on retrieving these CTC viably and then uh, performing single cell RNA-seq to see if there's what kind of biology drives these cells to survive in the bloodstream. And when you think about, um, there's an old slide I use a lot in when I have 50 slides, that when you think about cells floating down the bloodstream, it's kind of like people who go down the Niagara Falls, right? Like you can go down in a barrel, but if you go down in a regular barrel, you might die. It's probably the same thing with circulating tumor cells. Uh, they probably have some acquired abilities to survive in that harsh environment and actually land after they go through the Niagara Falls and then build a home and build a whole town there. So this, in this experiment, uh, this is a matched uh, sample on the left side uh, is a osteosarcoma patient tumor biopsy untreated. Um, and then on the right side is blood that has some enriched circulating tumor cells. So you can see that on the left side, there's spark called one, some of the bone matrix uh, proteins that are expressed highly in the tumor cluster, but not in the white cells that were in the immune microenvironment. And then uh, on the right side, you can see that little extension going up right there. Um, that is the small cluster of circulating tumor cells. And then if you compare them, um, you can actually do pathway analysis. In this patient, there's a Richter upregulation that was predicted in the circulating tumor cells. And so we're right now expanding this cohort to much larger patient groups. Um, you could also, one of the things that our, our in the cl uh, collaborative group uh, is doing. This is from uh, Dan Weiser's lab. Uh, he's using uh, targeted next-gen sequencing to detect recurrence. He has a targeted panel that he's validated and expanded a little bit recently, uh, looking for uh, SNVs, indels, and SVs, and all these genes that are known hotspot mutation areas. And then uh, here, this is his published data. We have we have current batch that's right now running, um, but he can predict patients. 
uh, who actually recur later. Uh, this is some data that um, kind of part of our group, um, all the groups kind of interact with each other. So this is from uh, Mark Applebaum's uh, group in Chicago, who I know probably is working with uh, Brian too. Uh, he looks at uh, 5-HMC profiling. So this is a concept based on the fact that cytosine gets methylated, and then after that, there's a hydroxyl group that's added to create 5-hydromethylcysteine. And so this is a gene activation mark, so you can actually profile, um, extract this out, PCR amplify it, sequence it, and profile gene activation in patients. Um, and here we used um, samples that came from the three collaborating groups that we collected locally, so my institute, uh, Dan Weiser's place, and then in Chicago. And here he was able to differentiate the 5-HMC pattern uh, of patients with relapse or newly diagnosed osteosarcoma from patients who were uh, were not patients, actually well child controls, who presumably do not have cancer. So some based on these studies, we're currently running this NPCF study, uh, MCC 20320. Um, there are probably multiple investigators in this room who also enroll patients for this trial. We're currently open at 14 sites and pending activation at 10 additional sites. Uh, as Brian mentioned, uh, we have a lot of these pilot data that yes, we can do it. Yes, we can look at retrospective samples and show that it's there or not, but really to use it clinically, we need to have a prospective trial. Um, so the aim is that, as I said, prospectively validate the use of CTC and CTDNA as biomarkers of recurrence. Um, we're actually enrolling for Ewing, Osteo, Fusion Negative, and Fusion Positive Rhabdo, and there's a Others Sarcoma Arm 2. And so it's pretty much all comers, and we've been enrolling really fast. Uh, the samples go to my lab, um, uh, where we do the CTC analysis, and is functions as a coordinating site. Uh, Dan Weiser's lab does work on the CTDNA. Uh, Mark Applebaum's lab works on the 5-HMC um, analysis. And then uh, David Loeb's lab does some cytokine analysis. And uh, this is the time points that we control, uh, collect the samples. Um, so this is, the time points were mainly designed after our preliminary data, for example, suggesting that CTC presence at end of therapy might be predictive, and that's why there's some additional red arms there. Because it's an all-comers trial, we, we tried to simplify the time points to make sure that Delayed local control and upfront local control probably captures almost everyone's treatment paradigm. Um, so right now, um, we're enrolling really fast. Where our goal is to get up to 50 for each cohort, and we're probably about half in Ewing and Ostia right now. So we're hoping to complete enrollment by next year, and then after that, there's the waiting period to see what happens. Um, some of the questions is that CTDNA and CTC are different, obviously, and what it indicates, what it predicts is different. So are they a biomarker of metastasis and recurrence? And also through these uh, more biology and deaf work, can we find what actually drives these metastasis? And as uh, kind of the theme of the talk is that we really need more well annotated samples that doubles in the details and collecting well annotated collected in appropriate way samples is actually very hard. So we're finding that challenging, but also with this new trial, we're finding it very uh, satisfying that we're, a lot of institutes are helping us. Uh, I want to acknowledge, obviously, all our uh, great patients and uh, my lab and people, funders and uh, collaborating labs and uh, people who really uh, do all the heavy lifting. And uh, I'll take patient uh, questions later. Thanks. All right, I'll be the, the, the finale before lunch. Um, so thanks everybody for your patience. Uh, and I do wanna say a big thanks to Anna Mateo for um, hitting me up back in the day. Uh, that it's, been a, it's been a fun journey and it's kind of circular here for me that um, Factor was the last conference I presented at in person before COVID. It's the first one, I, I know we're not after COVID, but <laughs> um, it just, it's, it's kind of circular. And, and I, I actually did my first year of advanced training 
here in San Diego. So it's kind of a weird nostalgia for me right now. So thanks. Thanks, guys, for having me again. Um, so uh, my name is Brian Flessner. I'm a veterinary oncologist. Uh, I will talk about some work that I collaborated with while I was at the University of Missouri. Um, we did a lot of this during COVID, so it was kind of interesting. Um, I'm now at the University of Pennsylvania, uh, and the company that um, this is through is called PetDX, and they're based here, actually, um, also in San Diego. So uh, my one disclosure is I'm on the clinical advisory board for PetDX. Um, I'm not going to belabor the, the comparisons between human and canine osteosarcoma. I think all of you know that pretty well now. Um, but for me, I see osteosarcoma uh, at a much higher incidence uh, than your patients. Uh, we see uh, 10 to 27 times higher uh, diagnoses of osteosarcoma in dogs. Um, our, I shouldn't say our, I'm not a dog, but <laughs> canine and human <laughs> genomes uh, share a high degree of homology. Uh, there's a, a box and whisker plot over here on the right side of this uh, um, screen, and you can see all genes, about an 85% um, homology between dogs and people, but specifically to tumor suppressor genes and oncogenes, um, there's about over 90% um, homology between the species. Um, the, the big thing here is that if we could profile these, uh, these genes, and, and we're going to talk about specifically for our work, uh, cell-free DNA and circulating tumor DNA, um, hopefully then if we can find those mutations, those changes in blood, uh, alter our, um, our treatment regimens or our staging, uh, uh, restaging diagnostics, hopefully we'll not only benefit my patients, but, but your patients and you as well. So uh, I get to put a dog schematic up here, which is always fun, right? So uh, I, I know Brian and, and, um, and others have already talked about liquid biopsy, but we're going to do specifically here cell-free DNA. So again, that's uh, DNA that's shed by tumors. It's free in circulation. Um, there is cell-free DNA from your normal cells, but also from tumor cells. And so that cell uh, circulating tumor DNA is ctDNA that we're going to talk specifically about. Um, this is uh, really nice. This is one of my favorite studies that I've done is we actually just do blood draws. And so comparing that to, you know, invasive tissue biopsies, this was a fun study. My nurses were like, thank goodness, we just have a blood draw study instead of these invasive things. Um, so really it is non-invasive um, and it's a way to detect um, and characterize. And I'm going to show some pretty cool examples at the end of how we could maybe manage our cases uh, differently with this. So um, this work is a subset of osteosarcoma patients that were part of a much larger study. Uh, this was a pretty big undertaking. Again, this was during COVID. I think we launched it in April or May across, uh, and <laughs> we say multiple continents, but it really was. Um, you can see on the map here that there were, I think it's, it says it in my small text there, but I think it's four or five continents across the, the world. Um, this paper is now published. Um, it's called the Cancer Detection in Dogs or CANDID study. Um, it's over a thousand dogs uh, with an independent testing set, uh, and the author block is pretty impressive. It's a lot of uh, not only veterinarians, but MDs and PhDs. So on the right-hand side of this screen is going to talk about three of the most common, or sorry, not common, but aggressive cancers. And so I think you'll probably see up there at the top, osteosarcoma is right up there. There's some uh, angiosarcoma, hemangiosarcoma folks in the crowd. And so angio is up there. We, we call it hemangio in our dogs uh, and lymphoma as well. And so this test, this liquid biopsy test is called Oncocanine. It had a 85% uh, sensitivity to detect uh, those cancers, those top three in the blood uh, and a 98.5% specificity. Um, there's other tumors underneath that aren't as aggressive um, and local tumors, um, you know, it, it's, it's not as high of a sensitivity. Um, and again, I think Brian mentioned this about urine. Um, you can find some uh, liquid biopsy specimens in urine, um, CSF for different intracranial tumors, but this, is, this was specific to, uh, to blood. So for the osteosarcoma work, we um, uh, evaluated 51 clinone dogs with definitive diagnosis of osteosarcoma. Uh, that's based on histo. Blood samples were collected from all the patients at time of diagnosis, and in a subset, and I'll show um, that data, we also had tumor tissue. So if those dogs did undergo amputation, we had um, tissue to compare um, in parallel to the liquid biopsy. So blood samples are, are uh, processed to isolate plasma, uh, and when then we extracted, or I didn't, the lab did <laughs> extracted DNA. I stay in the clinic where I belong. Um, DNA extraction, uh, library prep, and um, these samples underwent next-gen sequencing. Uh, and we looked for some somatic genomic alterations, and I'll show um, a bit of that. 
So um, my copy number plot, Brian, looks a dif bit different than yours. Uh, our, our patients have a few more chromosomes than in people. Uh, so I think if I remember right, it's 23 in folks, right? So our dogs have 38. Um, and I can't really show you with a, a, a laser pointer, but what you'll see here is the baseline there is blue. I hope that is projecting okay. So blue is kind of normal, if you will. And so you can have copy number gains or losses, and that will be either red as a gain or green as a, a loss. Um, the hot spot, and this looks really similar to yours, just more chromosomes, but this is an osteo dog that I, I saw Brian's, other Brian's uh, presentation where it, it, they look really similar. Um, our P53 mutations um, are on chromosome five, and I think that you guys, it's like double digits, right? Seven, 17, right? Yeah, so um, TP53 we'll talk about specifically is on chromosome five. Um, so the QC metrics for this 50 out of 51 dogs past QC, um, we had matched tumor samples in 37 dogs. We found somatic genomic alterations in the plasma of 80% of canine osteosarcoma patients, so that's at baseline. Um, and over half of dogs did have TP53 mutations, and again, that's in chromosome 5. So this is just to show you visually what, what that looks like. So P53 mutations were found in 58% of plasma samples. That's just uh, in the blood um, and in 46% of tissue samples. And so these two um, uh, Venn diagrams, if you will, show you the, the breakdown of if it's in both or one or the other. And so in 13 of the dogs, we only had plasma and did find uh, TP53 mutations in 9 out of 13 dogs. Sorry, I got to keep on going here. It's quick. <laughs> So, uh, and I think I won't belabor the tissue heterogeneity concept that's been shown pretty well by, by Ryan Roberts earlier today and, and you know, all the speakers. And so I, I think this schematic is kind of neat. Um, you'll see the, like we can call it the primary clone. Um, let's say that's the preliminary first osteosarcoma cell that developed. And then you get these subclones that are gonna be shown there in like teal and even purple. And so when you talk about tissue biopsy, um, and I have a cool example here at the end I'll show where we actually in this study took up to five post-amputation punch biopsies of the tumors. And so we have sequencing information from each of those sites and then compare that to the blood. So if you just think about this um, as, a, as a tissue biopsy gun, you know, it's hard to say I know exactly where those subclones are gonna live. And so you need to pass through those specific populations um, versus liquid biopsy, if all of those cells are turning over fast enough and releasing cell-free DNA, you might get a more comprehensive picture of all the different uh, alterations. So um, this is this is kind of the this, the slide I was um, alluding to. So uh, on the left here is the dog's uh, genomic DNA with its white blood cells. That's our control DNA. Um, and then you'll have your copy number plot. So up at the top here is going to be plasma. And I'm sorry, this is going to be really small, but I'll do my best to describe it. So you can see this is that same copy number plot I showed you. Um, again, five is the chromosome we look at p53 mutations um, and you can see some other gains and losses there so these are the two the five different tumor biopsies that were performed and again this is amputated dog where we actually then collect five different sites and we were pretty specific on going in different locations of tumor um, i don't know if this is going to project across the best but you can see in the plasma that red copy number gain uh, in chromosome one is present in tumor site number one but not necessarily in all the other tumor sites um, on the same token, um, we're looking at chromosome five number uh, now, and you can see that's um, present in the two of the tumor sites, but not the remaining three. And I think as we go along, you'll see that, that some of the tumor sites do have copy number gains or losses and others don't. Um, and that again, the plasma in this patient caught all of those different alterations. So this is where I got the most excited when we first talked about this study and our patient population of what, how do we use this? Like, it's great to say I can find P53 in blood or I can find genomic alterations, but what do we do during treatment? So this is a busy um, slide and I'll try to go through it really quickly. <laughs> so at baseline, this dog had both plasma and tissue collected. Again, those dogs had amputation. Um, and so you can see here the VAF is the variant allele frequency and that's specifically for P53 in this dog. And you can see in the tissue versus plasma, we have different percentages of how much of that variant allele is present. And again, across there, you can also see copper number gains and losses. So after amputation, we recheck dogs keep, uh, commonly at two weeks, and that's when we start chemotherapy. Um, this dog got carboplatin and had no evidence of disease at two weeks post and again at three months post. And so there's just a little um, schematic there of, of a pink 
piece of DNA that says cancer signal, if you will. So we detect the genomic alterations before treatment and then not after. What's um, really, really intriguing but scary is the way we monitor our patients is similar to you guys with imaging. So whether that's chest radiographs, CT radiographs, or abdominal ultrasound or CT, the dog had no evidence of disease at nine months, but the mutations showed back up again. So you can see the P53 mutation, the VAF is 56%, and we have those copy number gains and losses. So we're picking up relapse in the blood before we see it um, visually. Um, eventually the dog had pretty widespread metastasis, um, was euthanized, and um, uh, I think that still there is actually liver, and you can see a met to the liver there. Um, so um, just to show you that we can pick up uh, relapse before we can see it. Um, a second dog, the same kind of story, you'll see a P53 mutation in that fifth chromosome in both the plasma and in the tissue. Remission noted clinically and uh, liquid biopsy uh, for a few months. The dog had a suspected um, no evidence of disease on imaging at six and nine months, and it took till um, about, uh, sorry, at nine months it actually showed uh, progressive disease based on thoracic radiographs, um, but we picked up uh, potential relapse on liquid biopsy at, at six months. Um, so yeah, just to show you a few case examples, um, I hope this shows you again, I think we're all aware of how similar dogs and, and people are. We see a lot more um, uh, in, in, our, in our patient population, and I think this does um, also show that liquid biopsy gives us a non-invasive way to capture um, not only DNA mutations, but for, a, for me especially, to monitor minimal residual disease. So, ended that. Is this working? Oh, yeah. Thank you so much to all of our speakers. That was so great. Um, please, if you have a question, raise your hand. Um, in my uh, clinical work, I am a molecular pathologist and really focused on pediatric solid tumors, including osteosarcoma, and we are really looking for um, clinical ways that we can assess uh, biomarkers and genetic alterations that will help us to care for our patients, so identifying changes that could influence the diagnosis, prognosis, or therapy. And I think what we saw from all the speakers is that, you know, we really need more, uh, you know, targets to assess, and especially for osteosarcoma, because as Dr. Davis described, the, the, the primary specimens, the bony specimens are so challenging. So we really need to make use of every little um, piece of uh, tissue that we get, and, and a blood biopsy is such a, a, a compelling opportunity. So it's really great to hear about all of the work that you guys are doing. So I have, a, I have a question here. Uh, regarding HER2 positivity in when you look for HER2 in, in circulating tumor cells, what's the sensitivity in osteosarcoma compared when you have a circulating tumor cell assessment compared to a PET assessment with immunopet? Yeah, I, we actually don't know yet. I mean, that's one of the things we want to try to understand mm -hmm. from this study. And um, we know that we can, just from taking cancer cell lines and spiking them into blood samples from patients who don't have, or people who don't have cancer. We know we can detect HER2 expression on the surface, but we, we, we're trying to make sure that we have those assays like totally lined up perfectly before we actually go into the patient specimens from that trial. So hopefully, you know, a few months from now, I'd be able to answer that question, but at the moment, um, I just don't know the answer. We do know that everybody enrolled in that study had a clinical HER2 expression uh, that was, you know, validated by a clinical assay from a tumor biopsy specimen. So I think um, our baseline will be that we expect to see it, um, and we'll find out how good, the, how good the approach is for detecting it in CTCs. Good question. We have a question of our stage right. So it's somewhat, uh, so great talks, fantastic work. Thank you for all you're doing. It's somewhat tangential to actually what the panel presented on. But I was going to ask Dr. Church if she could present uh, a little bit about the Nature Medicine paper and what we should know about it. Uh, if you can comment, I would appreciate it. 
that is a bit tangential, but, <laughs> um, you know, we had a, a, a project that we've been working on for many years, and Brian Crompton has been involved, and we have um, patients enrolling from several centers all across the country, um, getting molecular tumor profiling done on their tumors, and we're trying to see if we can um, enroll them on clinical trials and make an impact on their care. Um, so we had a paper that just came out yesterday that really demonstrated the impact of molecular tumor profiling for children with cancer, um, both in terms of identifying alterations that can influence their diagnosis. So we had several patients who had a change in their diagnosis, and we had many patients who were matched to targeted therapy, and, and a few of the patients really responded very beautifully. So um, we're hoping that data will be a, a compelling um, uh, data point to really advocate for molecular tumor profiling for every child with cancer. Um, and it's important that, you know, to be able to demonstrate this utility, especially in a sort of really, what we like to think of as like a more real world model of the U.S. healthcare system where we have patients enrolling from all over the place in different, different centers. We had a range of different diagnoses. Osteosarcoma was the most common single diagnosis in that group. Um, and we really showed, um, you know, that benefit. So, thanks. Hello? Oh, there we go. In an effort to make it totally not tangential, um, an, a secondary, tertiary follow-up aim of that study uh, is, is to actually look at the liquid biopsy samples that were also collected to see if we can find the same genomic features. And uh, Dave Schulman will be, who's running the prospective study that I, uh, that I discussed earlier, uh, will be leading the charge to look at that um, on the GAIN study. So that's pretty exciting. Thanks for reeling us back in. <laughs> I do what I can. Any other questions from the audience? Sure way to calcify the broken tissue to be able to look at. So at frozen, no. There are some ways to handle the um <laughs> So frozen section needs to happen very rapidly, and so the decal, even a fast decal, still takes minutes to hours, and so we can't really wait at the time of frozen to go through a decal process. So what we usually do at the time of frozen um, is try to scrape out um, as much soft tissue as possible. So even, so I do a lot of bone frozens at my institution, as other Dr. Davis in the audience knows. Um, some institutions don't do bone frozens, but I do it pretty regularly. And so what, what we do is try to take as much soft component from a bone uh, curatage or biopsy as possible and freeze that. And so you can actually perform a frozen section on a bone um, tissue um, just not really large chunks of bone. So it is possible to do frozen on a bone tissue, but you have to kind of scrape out the big bone bits. So, so it, it's, it's longer, so you have to fix the tissue first, so it has to go through formalin fixation and then decalcification, so I would strongly advocate for just taking as much of the soft tissue, which is, I've never had a problem doing that and freezing that, and then keeping the bone bits for later. Yeah. <laughs> I think that that um, is up to the clinicians. I think that there's advocacy for decreasing anesthesia, risk to the patient. I think many people in, you know, think that that's the best thing for the patient. I think that there are ways to get enough needle core material for, for diagnostics and clinical purposes, but it needs to be a conversation between the pathologist, usually the interventional radiologist who's doing the procedure, um, and the oncologist is what is the aims? Is the aims only for diagnosis or are we trying to also do a research collection to know that, that we're getting adequate tissue for all of the aims? I would just add, I think it's hard to justify an open biopsy purely for getting research tissue. <clears throat> I think one of the advantages of some of the technologies we're developing for liquid biopsy is that there's, there's absolutely no reason those same technologies can't be applied to tumor samples. And, and because we're doing it like 
on the nano scale, an ultra, <laughs> ultra rare scale, there's no reason you need a big um, piece of tissue um, to then apply those liquid biopsy technologies to, to DNA extracted from a tumor biopsy. So I think, I hope, we're moving to a, a period of time where we need so little to get the molecular data. Um, uh, we, we have a little bit of a gap here between the liquid biopsy technologies in the lab that are totally working fine and getting them into a CLIA space with return of results, but that's going to happen. But if you're talking about a third of the patients relapse, um, it's not just for research. So I think that's a false dichotomy. I, I think the question, though, is can you pick up everything you need from a liquid biopsy at the time of relapse? But I, I mean, we don't know the answer to that, so. Um, I would also say that um, a lot of our techniques right now are getting much more sensitive. So, for example, the single cell RNA seq that I showed on a tumor, that's actually from half of a core. And so, it, where, where we had may, way more cells than we needed anyway. So, I, I'm hoping that the advancement of those technologies are going to make uh, also biopsies less invasive, too. I would point out one other thing that in the pathology lab, when we're getting core biopsies, that the primary person that's divvying up in most hospitals, I think it depends on which institution you're at, that most of the time the person triaging that tissue is actually not a pathologist. So you need to keep in mind that in the lab, it's usually a resident or a pathologist assistant, unless you're getting a, patho a pathologist involved early on and is asking for a pathologist to come down. So I think many of the institutions that this panelists are working at, we may be, have a pathologist get involved, but that's actually not the norm at most hospitals that's getting the initial biopsy. So if you're at a community hospital, if you're at even many big academic centers, the people that are actually handling the tissue in the gross room are going to be people that are going to be f feeling uncomfortable giving tissue away because their primary purpose is to make sure there is diagnostic material. And so being sensitive to understanding, you know, how is their comfort level of triaging some tissue for this or that may be different than if you have a pathologist that has more experience in knowing what is the diagnostic tissue looking at a core biopsy and saying that's tumor, that's necrosis, or knowing that they're ultimately responsible for that diagnostic tissue. So if I come down and say, yeah, you can give that one away, I'm ultimately responsible for that case is very different than my resident doing that or my PA doing that. And so being sensitive to understanding who's actually handling that tissue in the lab. Uh, thanks for a great set of talks. Um, I'm wondering if there are factors outside of uh, just the aggressiveness of disease biology that would impact on the amount of circulating tumor DNA or um, CTCs that are present. I can imagine things like uh, the presence of a pathologic fracture or, or other factors that could either um, give us sort of a, a false positive or, or a false negative. Yeah, or dehydration. Where, you know, I think, I think we probably need to be more attuned to these kind of things, but um, I, the best way to do that is to be doing uh, lots of collections on large cohorts that are really well clinically annotated, and that requires prospective studies, and I think the studies that um, Maz and I presented are examples, but even better at a COG 500 to 700 patient level, right, with the data like as pristine as we ever get in clinical cancer research. That'll be the last question for this can, panel. Can I make one comment about um, uh, Jess's work? I think, you know, the it's so important that we get good specimens for the work clinically and research we want to do. And there's, as far as I can tell, virtually no academic credit and no glory that goes along with this work. And it's many, 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 many hours uh, to make sure that guidance is, is in our prospective studies. It's been, in my opinion, it's going to be game changing, but we'll see for sure in the upcoming COG studies. So I just want to thank Jess and Ryan and John, all the people who, went in, who did that work, because uh, I think it's going to make a big difference for this field. Well, thank you to the panel and all the panels from earlier today. Uh, we're going to break for lunch, 12 to 1. And after lunch, if you would, if you could get to the North Lawn at 1 o'clock, we're going to do a group photo. And then we'll resume the talks this afternoon at 1.30.